am sad to announce to you that this is Matt's last day in chapel for this year. Oh. Mm, it is sad. It is sad. Thanks for reminding me of that. Yeah, really, anytime. And <laughs> I, I just, I just want to say publicly how much I appreciate his ministry to us these two weeks. I appreciate the fact that he brought his family up so I could get my high five buddy. Okay, <laughs> And uh, I pray that uh, as you present today and then tonight at the bonfire that God would richly bless. But young people, I want us to take a moment. Do you want to express your gratitude to Mr. David? It um, really, truly has been a, a privilege and a joy to, uh, to get to hang out with a lot of you for two weeks, some of you just this one week, but uh, it truly has been an honor and a blessing. I, I can't say enough uh, how thankful I am uh, for what God did in my life while I was here where you are as a camper, and to be able to come back and to share in what God is doing uh, in your lives is an incredible, incredible privilege. And so uh, I just want you to know that you have been a blessing to me. You've been an encouragement to me. I look forward to keeping up with you and staying in touch and uh, seeing what God does in your lives. We've been talking these last couple weeks about living for the glory of God. And the verse that we used to guide our thoughts was this verse. So whether you eat or whether you drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. How many of you ate your bacon this morning to the glory of God? All right. I love bacon day. And uh, I'm thankful for the new covenant and the provision, <laughs> the provision that it makes for bacon. But you know you can eat to the glory of God when you... When you eat to the glory of God, you are recognizing that God's provided for your needs. And you can say, God, I thank you for this food and I, I, I appreciate it and I, I eat to your glory. You can drink. You, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. The greatest thing that you can do in life is to live for the glory of God. Never forget that. That the greatest thing that you can do, whatever it is that God leads you to pursue, whether it's music or teaching or some other career path, the most important thing isn't what you do. It's who you are and who you live for. And the greatest thing that you can do in life is to live for the glory of God. Romans 11.36 says, For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. I had uh, an idea of what I wanted to, to share on this last day of chapel for quite some time, for several months. And as I came to work on that message, I just could not do it. Just couldn't do it. As I tried to prepare, it just, I just, for whatever reason, could not prepare the message that I wanted to share with you this morning. And so I began to pray, and as God began to speak and lead, He led me to a completely different topic. So I'm excited to, to see what God has for us this morning, because I didn't plan on sharing this message. It wasn't my idea, but God led me to it. I want to talk to you this morning about something that I think is the number one thing that prevents us from living for the glory of God. The number one thing that prevents us from living for the glory of God. It's something that enters our lives usually very slowly, very silently, very quietly. But it has the ability to destroy us from within and it has an incredibly toxic effect on our soul. It's something that's destroyed the lives of great men and great women. It's something that has the power to destroy your life. It's something that God hates. In fact, it's the very thing that keeps people from God and repels His presence in our lives. And what that thing is, this insidious toxin, is pride. Pride has been working its destruction for thousands and thousands of years. And pride will keep you from living for the glory of God. What is pride? There's probably a lot of definitions, but I'm going to give you Dan's definition of pride. And that's this. Pride is thinking too much of self and too little of God. Very simply put, pride is thinking too much of yourself and too little of God. When I was a, a camper... I had the privilege one night of our devotions being led by Dr. Sam Shu, And I will never forget that night. Uh, we were uh, at uh, then PCB, 
and we went out to a, one of the classrooms and, and Dr. Shu met us and that night he, he shared one verse with us and I can still remember that moment. I can still remember that night and that verse. And it was Micah chapter 6 verse 8 and he taught us this. He said, He has shown all of you people what is good and what the, the Lord does require of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And I never forgot that. I never forgot that moment. I never forgot how he shared with us that night. And it wasn't just that he was teaching us something, but he lived that in front of us. He was extremely talented and extremely gifted, an incredible musician. But if you had the privilege of knowing him, you know that humility was a genuine characteristic in his life. And his life and his example spoke powerfully to me when I was a camper. God calls us to walk humbly. I want to look at a story this morning of a man who was great, who was godly, who was powerful, who was influential, but a man whose life was destroyed by pride. And if you have your Bible this morning, 2 Chronicles is where we're going to go. So Old Testament, 2 Chronicles chapter 26, and we're going to begin in, in verse 3. 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 26, verses 3. And five. We're going to read about a king of Judah whose name was Uzziah. And a lot of you have probably heard of Uzziah from Isaiah chapter 6, right? How many of you are familiar with Isaiah 6, right? In the, king, in the year King Uzziah died. And how many of you, that's about as much as you know about Uzziah? Anybody? All right. So for you, you're going to learn a little bit more. For some of you, this might be review. But for a long time in my Christian walk, I only knew him as the guy who died. All right? You know, it was just like, wow, okay. In the year King Uzziah died. But Uzziah, it says in, in 2 Chronicles 26, 3, Uzziah was 16 years old when he began to reign. It's kind of a scary thought, but we'll, we'll skip over the scariness of a 16-year-old king. It says he reigned for 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Yekaliah of Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. And he set himself to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. Now, I just want us to notice a couple of things before we continue on with the story. It says that as Uzziah becomes king, that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And he set himself to seek God. And so we get this picture of this king of Judah. He was a godly man. He followed God's ways. He followed God's law. He lived by God's precepts. And he sought God. He sought after the things of God. And he had a man in his life named Zechariah. And this is not the Zechariah who is the author of the prophet Zechariah in the, in the Bible. It's another man. But this man, Zechariah, instructed him and taught him how to fear God. And fearing God isn't being scared of God. Fearing God is not being afraid of God. Fearing God is reverencing God. It's seeing God for who He is. It's having God in the right position in your life which is him being God and you not being God. But you see, pride is the opposite. When we are proud, we push God out of his place in our life and we decide that we want to be God in our life. And if you want to be God in your life, you're not going to be able to live for the glory of the one true God. Looking on in verse 6 and down through 15. Just a real quick glimpse of this man Uzziah. It said, He went out and made war against the Philistines, Israel's enemies. And he broke through the wall of Gath and the wall of Jabna and the wall of Ashdod. And he built cities in the territory of Ashdod and everywhere among the Philistines. Look at verse 7. God helped him. If you're an underliner, highlighter, scribbler in your Bible, you might want to underline, highlight, or scribble right there. Because God is telling us why Uzziah was so successful. Not because of anything about him or in him, but because God was with him and God helped him. God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabians who lived in Gurabal and against the Meunites. And the Ammonites paid tribute to Uzziah. And his fame spread even to the border of Egypt. So even his enemies respect him and honor him and pay tribute to him. Moreover, 
Uzziah, or, or if you look back in verse 8, it says, For he came, became very strong, his fame spread even to the border of Egypt. Moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, at the valley gate, and at the angle, and fortified them. He built towers in the wilderness and cut many cisterns, for he had large herds, both in Shephelah and in the plain. He had farmers and vine dressers in the hills and in the fertile lands, for he loved the soil. My son also loves the soil. <laughs> All right. Now, in case you're wondering what it means there, it means he was a great man of agriculture, all right? My son is not a great man of agriculture. He just likes to play in the dirt. <laughs> and so he was a lover of the soil. Moreover, Uzziah had an army of soldiers fit for war and divisions according to the number and the muster made by Jel, the secretary, Emesiah, the officer, under the direction of Hananiah, one of the king's commanders. The whole number of the heads of the father's houses of the mighty men of valor was 2,600. Under their command was an army of over 300,000 who could make war with mighty power to help the king against the enemy. And Uzziah prepared for all the army shields, spears, helmets, coats of mail, which are really armor, okay, not letters. You with me? You awake? All right. They weren't sticking letters all over themselves, but it was really armor. I used to get confused by that. Bows and stones for slinging. And in Jerusalem he made engines invented by skillful men to be on the towers and the corners to shoot arrows and great stones. And his fame spread far, for he was marvelously helped until he was strong. And so we get this picture here in 2 Chronicles 26 of Uzziah. He was a powerful and mighty king. He was a great military leader. He was an inventor of new and advanced weaponry. And so he was not just a, a powerful king, but he had a brilliant mind. And he invented new weapons. He was a great builder. He was a powerful leader that even Israel's strongest enemies would pay tribute to and fear. He was well renowned around the world. He was a great agriculturalist. He had everything going for him. The reason for his success, the reason that he was able to do these things, look back in verses 4 and 5. He had God's blessing on his life. He had God's favor on his life life. He sought God. He searched out his ways. And when he did, God blessed him and God helped him. Literally there in verse 5 where it says God made him to prosper, it literally means, it literally means this, that God pushed him ahead. So where it says God made him to prosper, it's literally this idea of God pushed him along, that his success, that his abilities, the things that he accomplished were not because of who he was, but because of who God was. And so God was working greatly in the life of Uzziah, and God was using him greatly. If you look down in verse 15, it says that Uzziah was marvelously helped. So God didn't just surround him and push him ahead, but he surrounded him. To, to be marvelously helped, that phrase there in the Hebrew means to be surrounded by God. And so he had God's presence around him. He had God pushing him along. As he sought God, as he feared God, as he walked with God, that's what was happening. So we get this picture. Uzziah is a godly king. He loves God. He follows God's ways. He seeks after the things of God. And God has blessed him incredibly and is using him in incredible ways. Godly, powerful, successful, respected, blessed, surrounded by God, pushed along by God. But sadly, his life is about to take a disastrous turn. Because something is happening inside of Uzziah. And while God is blessing him and while God is using him, a silent villain is working its power, creeping into the recesses of his heart and of his mind, silently taking over inch by inch, crouching like a lion, waiting to pounce. The silent intruder's name, of course, is pride. You know, there's something about success that tempts our heart like few other things. A lot of us have been in a place where we knew that we couldn't do something and we needed God's help. And we prayed, we asked, said, God, I need your help. I can't do this. Maybe it was an audition. Maybe it was an exam. Maybe it was some situation that you were faced with. Or maybe it was a trial and, and you said, God, I need your help. And, and you prayed and God helped you. And then afterwards you thought, wow, I did a pretty great job. Have you ever been there? Have you ever asked God to help you? And he did and then you took the credit. Nothing tests the heart. Nothing tests the heart quite like success. If you want to find out what's really in you, 
You'll find out when you're successful. Pride crept into Uzziah's life. Look at what it says in verse 16. It says, when he grew strong, he grew proud. To his destruction. For he was unfaithful to the Lord his God. And he entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. You see, nothing tests the heart quite like pride. And quite like success, rather. Nothing tests our heart like success. Here was Uzziah, so successful, so blessed by God, that he decided, you know what? I'm going to do something that only the priest should do. But you know God sent 81 to Uzziah. 81 messengers come to warn him. They're like, Uzziah, you're great and you're godly and all these things, but you're making a really big mistake. Don't do this. God sends warnings into our lives. But pride thinks too much of self and too little of those who love you and care about you, who try to warn you about things in your life. Uzziah was proud, and he didn't want to listen. And so look at verse 19. It says, Then Uzziah was angry. Now he had a censer in his hand to burn incense, and when he became angry with the priests, when he rejected their message, when he said no to their warning, when he refused to listen, leprosy broke out on his forehead in the presence of the priests in the house of the Lord by the altar of incense. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead. And they rushed him out quickly, and he, he himself hurried to get out because the Lord had struck him. And King Uzziah was a leper the day of his death. And being a leper, he lived in a separate house for he was excluded from the house of the Lord. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's household, governing the people of the land. Now the rest of the acts of Uzziah from the first to the last, Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, wrote. And Uzziah slept with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the burial field that belonged to the kings, for they said, He is a leper. What a sad ending to a great life. <coughs> Here's Uzziah, one of the most powerful people in the world at his time. Godly, successful, blessed, great military leader, brilliant mind, a builder, an agriculturalist, pushed ahead by God, surrounded by God, the favor of heaven upon his life, the blessings of God on him. But even he was not immune to pride. And when he became strong and when he became successful, he began to think, it's all about me. And I can do whatever I want. And pride destroyed him. And God tried to warn him. God was so gracious. He sent a warning to him. And God is gracious with us. He sends warnings to us. But Uzziah was proud. He wouldn't listen. And he ruined the rest of his life. He lived as a leper with a horrible skin disease. He had to be isolated from the rest of society. And his epitaph, his remembrance, there in verse 23, was not all the great things that he did, but that he 
was a lie. All because of pride. All because he didn't listen. David had warned of pride years before this. He says, though the Lord is great, he cares for the humble. But he keeps his distance from the proud. Pride will repel the presence and the power of God from your life. Now, nothing can separate you from Christ. Nothing separates you from the love of God if you're in Christ. If you know Jesus as your Savior, you can be confident of that. But I will tell you this, when there's pride in your heart, you're pushing God out of your life. He doesn't leave you as far as being your Savior. Your, your eternal destiny doesn't change, but His power and His presence is not present in your life the way it should be. You're pushing God out of your life. God calls you to live for His glory. And pride will keep you from living for God's glory. Pride is the sin that we don't usually see until it's too late. Pride is a way of sneaking up. I don't think Uzziah ever realized how much pride had entered his heart. And so I want to ask you this morning, are the warning signs of pride in your life? And I just want to, to just go over a few of them. Are the warning signs of pride in your life? Are you finding yourself more loyal to things other than God? If you want to do a check and say, is pride an issue for me? Then ask yourself this, am I more loyal to anything other than God? And if there's something in your life that you're more loyal to, more dedicated to, more devoted to, even if it's a good thing, that's pride. God says that he should be first. Are you failing to seek the Lord consistently? One of the great signs of pride is that when we stop spending time here, when we stop spending time in prayer before our Father, when we stop worshiping God, are you failing to seek the Lord consistently? Are you trusting in your talent more than you're trusting God? I mean, I've got to spend two weeks with you and I'm amazed by your talents. You have so much talent, <clears throat> musically, intellectually. I'm impressed with your talent. God's given you that talent, and he wants you to sharpen it, refine it, and use it for his glory. It's a good thing. But the danger in being talent is this, is that you can think that I have the ability, and I have the power, and it's about me, and I'm so great, and I'm so talented, and I trust my talent more than I trust God. Another warning side of pride is that you think more about yourself than you think about others. When you think more about yourself than you think about others, it's a sure sign that pride is at work in your life. Do you get angry when you're confronted about issues in your life? Remember what happened to Uzziah? 81 preachers show up and say, Uzziah, you're making a mistake. Don't do this. And he got angry with them. When you get angry when you're confronted about things in your life, it's a sign of pride. Because pride makes you resentful when corrected, impatient when hindered, <coughs> critical when speaking of rivals, jealous when seeing others advance, and untruthful when confronted, distant when slighted. When you're unteachable, and unwilling to listen. These are but some of the signs and the symptoms of pride. And I want you to take heed to the warning because it may be that God is warning you today about pride. It may be that God is trying to get your attention so that you don't go down the same disastrous route that Uzziah did. Example to us, not to push God out of our lives and not to allow its toxic effect into us. So pride pushes God out of your life. So what do we do? How do we fight this battle? Because no matter where you're at in this issue of pride, it's something that all of us need to constantly check our heart for. Because it creeps in silently, and it will destroy our life. James chapter 4, verse 6 says, But he gives more grace. Therefore God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I like football. Any football fans? All right. Sadly, I was born in Eagles fan. By birth. It's a lot that I must bear in life. I will always bleed silver and green. It's not always easy. In fact, it's never been easy. 
But I, I do love the game of football. It's the right amount of strategy, teamwork, and violence. It's just all in the <laughs> Just like first. <laughs> well, we, we try to do the violence. Try to do it. But in football, when a running back has the ball and he is trying to gain yardage and someone comes to tackle him, one of his options is to try to stiff arm his opponent. To hold him back. And, and I love that illustration because that's exactly what this word means here when it says God opposes the proud. Literally, it's that God holds us at a distance. It's literally like, like God is stiff arming you and he's saying, No, I will not let you close to me. I will not let you be near me. My blessing and my favor and my grace will not be over you. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so I want to challenge you to humble yourself daily before God. As Micah chapter 6, 8 instructs us to walk humbly with our God. Because God responds to humility. Humility attracts the power and the presence of God into our lives. God is a God who gives grace to the humble. So James says in James chapter 4 verse 10, Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will exalt you. You see, God has a great plan for your life, and God is not against you being great. God is not against you being a skilled musician. God is not against you being intelligent and smart and successful. He just doesn't want you to ever think that it's about you or your abilities. He wants you to understand that it's about Him and His power and His grace at work in your life, and that everything that you have and everything that you are ultimately is to be for His glory. And ultimately, your life is to be seen as an instrument and a tool to bring glory to God. It's not about you. Life isn't about you. It's about God. It's about His glory. It's about His kingdom. It's about living for and serving His purposes. And pride will keep you from that. Pride will destroy your life. And I don't want to see that happen to any of you. But I know it's a risk and a danger. It's a battle that I fought. It's a battle that all of us have to fight. Because Satan will always tempt us to think more of ourselves than we ought to. He will always tempt you to think that it's about you. And in the culture that we live in, we especially have to fight this battle, don't we? Because we live in a world that says that life is all about who? You. <coughs> think about the commercials that you see on television. All of them are telling you that life is about you, about doing something for you, about experiencing something. Life is about you. Live for you. And God says, I call you to live for me, not for you. I call you to live in a different way than the culture calls you to live. I call you to live with a new set of values, a new set of precepts. I call you to live as a citizen of my kingdom. God wants to exalt you. He wants to use your life in a great way. He has a great plan for every one of you. And I don't want to see any of you miss the plan that God has for you. But I know this, that if pride fills your heart, you'll miss the plan that God has for your life. But I also know this, that if you walk humbly with your God, you'll never miss what God has for you. He'll lead you, He'll guide you, He'll push you along, He'll surround you. God, who surrounded Uzziah and who, who worked in his life, who pushed him ahead, who prospered him, he'll do the same for you. If you're humble. I mentioned uh, a few times over this week that there were just a few things that so impacted my life as a camper here. One of them was getting to hear Gladys Chahi share her life verse. Galatians 2.20. And I can still to this day hear her quoting this book. She said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself to me. It's really the heart of how to live a humble life. It's to recognize that if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, that he purchased you at a great cost with the blood of his Son. Paul said, I recognize 
that Jesus' death has been applied to my life. I've been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live. It's not about me anymore. For all of his life, before Paul met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, he lived for Paul. He was intelligent. He was gifted. He was a leader of the Jews. He was a great teacher. And he lived for his glory. He lived for his desires. He lived for himself. But after he met Jesus, he lived in a completely different way. He says, it's no longer about me. It's no longer about what I want, what I desire. It's no longer about my plans and my dreams. But it's about Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh. He says, I'm still here. But it's different. Because I live by faith in the Son of God. Who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus modeled humility for us. He is our example. The Bible says that Jesus humbled himself all the way to become a man. Can you imagine that God, the creator, the sustainer of the universe, became a man? He took on the form, not only of a man, but of a servant. The night before he died, as he gathered with his disciples to share the Passover with them, to explain to them that the Passover wasn't just about looking back to Egypt, but it was about looking forward to himself and what he was going to do is he was about to become our Passover so that God's judgment might pass over us. And as he prepared to share with them his mission, his heart, he did something so completely unexpected that it threw Peter completely for a loop. He got a bowl of water and a towel and he began to wash the disciples' feet. Now, I don't like feet, all right? And feet in this day were even worse because everybody wore sandals and walked on dirt roads. And so when you would go to somebody's house, and because you, you ate dinner like this, this is how they ate dinner, all right? You climbed around a low table. Now, think about this. Where the next person? What are you right next to? <laughs> That's right. Their feet. So it was really important that feet got washed before dinner. <laughs> and the, the lowest slave or servant or member of the household would have foot washing duties. But that night, Jesus took the towel, and he took the bowl, and he washed the disciples. He says, this is how you're to, to look at life, and this is how you're to treat one another. And he modeled the essence of true humility, which was to serve and live for others. And then, the next day, he took humility even further as he bore the shame and the reproach of your sin <coughs> on the cross. As he died in your place. As he surrendered himself to the Father's plan, he demonstrated that for us what true humility looks like. And God calls us to live with humility. The greatest thing that you can do in life is to live for the glory of God. And if you're going to live for the glory of God, you must walk humbly with God. I want to, you to bow your heads this morning as we seek the Lord in prayer. I know that pride can be an issue in all of our lives. This morning I'm going to ask you, is pride an issue in your life? I'm not asking you if you think pride is an issue in your roommate's life. I don't, I'm not asking if you think other people here have pride issues. I'm asking you. Is pride an issue in your life? Pride is thinking too much of yourself and too little of God. And if it is, God is sending you a gracious one to humble yourself. And for all of us, He's calling us to be aware that pride can creep into our life at any time, at any place. And that walking humbly with God is a daily pursuit of keeping our eyes on Jesus. Remembering that life is about Him and His kingdom and not about us. And choosing to live for the glory, not of self, but for the one who created us and made us, the one who gave His Son for us, and the one who's coming again to bring us into His kingdom where we'll spend eternity. Father, I just pray for each person here this morning. I know in my own heart, the issue of pride can be such a great struggle and a great battle. 
And Father, I just pray for each person that if they're dealing with pride today, Father, that you would cause them to turn, to repent, and to seek humility in their life. And Father, I pray that you would give us the ability, by your grace, to walk humbly with you, day by day, moment by moment, in our lives. And Father, that we would keep our eyes on you, that we would remember your example, that we would remember that life isn't about us, and Father, that we would choose to live for your glory, for your kingdom, because it all belongs to you, and it's all coming to you. So Lord, help us to remember what matters, and to live for you. We love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name.